Good morning, church. Happy Sabbath to everyone. Are you glad to be in the house of the Lord this morning? I know I am. But even more importantly, are you glad to know Jesus Christ? Uh, every day, I just appreciate him more and realize that it's only because of Jesus that I'm sometimes able to get through the day. And I don't know what people do without him. A um, special song that just praises his, his name. And if you'd praise his name with me in your heart, I'd appreciate it this morning. Amen.
My sermon title for today is A Revelation of Love. A Revelation of Love. You know, during this past school year, and actually ever since Jules really been going to school, her and I have a, a routine or a custom that we, we follow every morning. Almost as soon as we leave the driveway, we'll begin talking about what we're going to pray about for that day. Um, we'll usually go through five or six things, and then I'll allow Jewel to pray, and then I'll pray. And we have these customary things we normally pray about. We pray that Jewel will have a good day, that she'll get along with her friends, that she'll show kindness to other people, even when they don't show kindness to her. We'll pray for Mommy to find a good job, etc., etc. And then if there's something unique happening that day, something special, we'll thank Jesus that it's happening, and we'll ask him to help everything to go well. Like we did when she had her end-of-the-year school party there at the school. And of course it did go very well and she was very happy about that. But I'll never forget the morning when we had just finished praying, we're driving down the road, and Jewel says to me, Daddy, we talk to Jesus every morning. I learn about Jesus at school, but I just don't see him in my life. My heart about stopped. It's like, whoa, wow. Now remember, Jewel is seven years old. She doesn't face a lot of the same things that you and I face as adults. And this is a child, and she's saying that. I had to say a silent prayer quickly. Lord, help me. Then I reassured her that Jesus is working in her life. That he's in her life, he's working all around her, and then we said another prayer, and I asked God to reveal himself to her in a very real way. But, you know, as I think about it, if my seven-year-old daughter can feel like that, chances are some of us do too. I mean, come on, our minds are full of everything. They're full of work and bills, household chore, taxes, people who have insulted us. Bad health, pride at times, schoolwork, children, and I could go on and on. Life is hard sometimes, which can make us ask the same question as my jewel. Where is God in my life? Where is God in my life? With all that stuff, with the busy, fast-paced world we live in, how can you and I know that God is interested in us personally? That he really cares about us? How can we know that he's working in our lives? And if he is working in our lives, why is it so difficult sometimes? When my life is spiraling out of control, where is God? When I unexpectedly lose my job, where is God? When I can't find a job and I'm struggling to pay the bills and I'm praying and things don't get better but worse, where is God? When I feel lonely, like no one understands what I'm going through, where is God? When someone I love more than anything dies after I've been praying for them, where is God? Or when my life is tough and I come through the doors of the church and I'm looking forward to receiving a blessing, a place where I'm supposed to find peace and no stress and that brother or that sister seemingly takes a knife and sticks it through my heart and acts like they didn't do anything wrong. Where is God? Amen. What can God do or say beyond this to encourage me? What can he do to reach me in my present circumstance and everything I'm going through in my life right now? What can he say to really let me know he's been coming, he's coming soon? I've been hearing that since I was Levi's age. 
How can I know that he has my back when I'm going through much, through so much in my life? Those are all really tough questions. And sometimes they're really hard to answer. But they demand answers. So let's go to God's word and see if we can find some this morning. Before we do, of course, we need to pray. So please bow your heads with me at this time. Lord God, as we're asking these very difficult questions about this thing called life, we need the infilling of the Holy Spirit this morning. We need understanding We need to hear a word of encouragement from you. So I pray, Lord, in the name of Jesus, that you would come and let us see you here this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Sometimes God saves the best for last. Amen? Sometimes he saves the best for last. And that's what you find when you go through the Bible and you get to the book of Revelation. You know, we believe it to be the last book written in the entire Bible, probably written around A.D. 95. And we know that the Apostle John was who God chose to author it. The theme of the book of Revelation is that Jesus will return to this earth, destroy the wicked, and bring the world to an end with power and great glory. That's what it's all about. And you know, that might be exactly exactly what you and I need to hear at such a time as this. A time when life is hard and the future doesn't look so bright in the world around us. A time when our country seems to be divided, seriously divided. A time when terrorists are killing people all over the world and sometimes right here at home. A time when the economy and retirement doesn't look so good anymore. A time when some of us are more in love with the things of the world than we are in love with God. I think maybe that's exactly why God gave the revelation to John so long ago. You see, he knew, he knew that not only would those seven churches in Asia Minor need this, he knew you and I would need it in the year 2014. He knew that we would need it. He knew that many of us would wrestle with questions just like my daughter did that morning on the way to school. Where is God in my life? Well, let's go to the Word and see if we can find some answers. Revelation chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. I'm going to put the words on the screen, or you can turn in your Bibles and follow along with me. Revelation chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. The revelation of Jesus Christ which God gave him to show his servants things which must shortly take place. And he sent and signified it by his angel to his servant who, church? John, who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ. To how many things? All things that he saw. Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things. What's that word? Keep those things which are written in it for the time is what? The time is near. Sorry, I didn't change the slides as I got caught up reading my Bible. God through the prophet John, you see, wants to give us a wake-up call this morning. He wants to warn us. He wants to reassure us. He wants to encourage us because, you see, we are his last day people. We are his last day people. Do you believe that? He knows that we live in a world that's trying to pull us in every direction. A world that's trying to confuse us. A world that tells us every single day we're alive that sin is okay. That sin is all right. So what does God do? Get this. God the Father gave a revelation of Jesus to Jesus... Going by the text. And Jesus gave it to his angel. His angel gave it to John. John gave it to the seven churches of Asia Minor. And through the Bible, he's given it to us. It's a lot. That's a lot of passing around, if you will. But that was God's plan. 
The revelation or unveiling of Jesus in the book of Revelation is so dynamic, it's so incredible, that it was completely relevant to the seven churches all the way back there 2,000 years ago. And guess what? It's perfectly relevant for us today. The book of Revelation is a combination. It's a combination of the Word of God and the testimony of Jesus. What is the testimony of Jesus? Revelation 19.10 spells that out. It says it's the spirit of prophecy. In this case, apocalyptic prophecy. That's a long word. What's apocalyptic mean? Apocalyptic means describing the complete destruction or end of the world as we know it. That's what it means. That's what kind of prophecy the book of Revelation is. I'm sure you probably had thoughts and you've heard others say that Revelation is a very strange book because of all the symbolism that's in it. But God, through John, lets us know about that symbolism right up front, right in the beginning, because he writes this. Check it out. And he, Jesus, sent it, the Revelation, to John through his angel, and he did what, church? He signified it. The Greek word for signified is samano. It literally means that Christ gave it to John through signs and symbols. That's the way he gave it to him. Pretty amazing. I thought that was really cool when I found that out. Really cool. That was God's plan. He gave it to him through signs and symbols. It's probably because of the, there's so much symbolism in it that many don't realize that the word of Revelation, the book of Revelation, was intended to be read in a church setting out in the open. That's the way God planned for it to come out. Seems a little strange with all the symbolism, but that was God's plan. The people in the seven churches, and by extension, since it's in his word, us, are expected to, when we hear it, obey it and follow it. Of course, I'm sure they needed to do some explaining, interpreting back there in the seven churches. And guess what? That's my job this morning, to make sure that everything is understandable. Otherwise, God's message won't mean much to any of us. Rather than receiving a curse for reading and studying the book of Revelation, like many uninformed, pe uninformed people have suggested over the years, John actually promises a very real and distinct blessing. But of course, the blessing, like God's other blessings, is conditional. It's conditional. John says that we must read or hear the words. That's the first part. I can help you with that. The second part is a choice that you and I have to make individually. And that is we have to keep the words of the prophecy. Are you with me? We have to read or hear, then we have to keep the words. John does not tell us right here exactly what this blessing is that's promised. It doesn't say exactly what it is. But I think it's easy to imagine that the blessing involves reformation and revival, which will translate to a living connection with our Savior. John wants us to understand that we do not have a lot of time to work with. We do not have a lot of time to work with. Because he says the time is what, church? It's near. The time is near. Now, John wrote that 2,000 years ago. The time was near then, or well, the time is really near now. The time is near. What time is near? The second coming of Christ is near. We do not know the day or the hour, but we can tell that it's near. You know, because we don't know the day or the hour, because we're not sure how long this thing may go on, because, you know, we're pretty stubborn, we're pretty stiff-necked, we're pretty hard-headed, and we're willing to change very slow, probably slower than a turtle, because of all that, I just got to say that 
And I've said it before, I'm going to keep saying it, life is uncertain. Life is uncertain. If my life is cut short, I'm either going to come up in the first or the second resurrection. So it could be a lot nearer than we think. Did you hear about the accident that happened this week? The motorcycle in the car? I understand the lady went out to get some butter, I believe. Slipped out to get some butter and gets hit by a motorcycle so hard that it flips her car. How that happened, I still am having a hard time understanding, but that's what happened. The motorcycle rider died almost instantly, apparently. And the lady driving the car died a couple days later. Apparently has a little boy. Heartbreaking. But you know what? When those people who probably I'm sure had never met before, got out of the bed that morning and put their clothes on like you and I do, they probably felt like they had their whole lives in front of them. Their whole lives in front of them. If they would have only known that was their day, that everything was coming to a close for them on that day. Life is uncertain. The return of Jesus is near. It's near. Tragically, While so many are distracted with everything the world has to offer, the eternal clock in heaven says the world is almost out of time. If your relationship with God is not what it should be, know, hear, please believe the time is short. The time is short. It's time to stop messing around. It's time to get serious about this thing. The book Steps to Christ says it well. Kind of an ominous warning. Many will be lost, it says. While hoping and desiring to be Christians, they do not come to the point of yielding the will to God. They do not now choose to be Christians through the right exercise of the will. An entire change may be made in your life. By yielding up your will to Christ, you ally yourself with a power that is above all principalities and powers. You will have strength from above to hold you steadfast, and thus through constant surrender to God, you will be enabled to live the new life, even the life of faith. When I was praying about what to speak about this week, this kept coming back. I was going somewhere else, and God says, nope, it's this. Let's look at verses 4 through 8. John to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come and from the seven spirits which are before his throne and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead and the ruler over the kings of the earth to him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. And has made us kings and what church? Priests. Kings and priests to his God and Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Behold, he's coming with clouds. And how many eyes are going to see him? Every eye is going to see him. Even those who pierced him and all the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him. Even so, amen. I am the Alpha. And the Omega, the beginning and the end, says the Lord, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. You know, 1 John 4.19 tells us that we cannot love God or get serious about God or our heavenly future until we first begin to realize how much he loves us. We must come to realize all that he's done for us And what we as believers now have through him. Until we come to that realization, chances are we're just playing church. Just going through the motions. No matter what position we hold in the church, could even be the pastor. Or how long our name has been on the church roll. John knows this, so he doesn't waste any time taking the seven churches and us there. He begins by offering this very unique greeting. First from himself, 
And then from the one who is, and who was, and who is to come, which is who? God the Father. This is from God the Father. The seven spirits of God, which is who? A symbolic name for the Holy Spirit. And from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, the ruler of the kings of the earth, the one who loved us and released us from our own sins by his blood. You see, from the start, it seems as if John is laying the groundwork to help us to understand how awesome God the Father is, how awesome the Holy Spirit is, and how awesome Jesus the Son is, so we can fully appreciate the incredible sacrifice that was made on our behalf. Jesus went to the cross, we've talked about this many times, not because he had to, but because he loves you and he loves me. He wanted to. He wanted to. Not that he wanted to suffer and die, but he would rather suffer and die than to have you die. God the Father and the Holy Spirit suffered with Jesus through that ordeal on the cross, and they did it for us. They've never stopped working on our behalf because of the great love they have for us. Not because we are good or worthy of their love, but simply because they are good. Because we are their offspring. We're their children. We belong to them. They made us. You understanding this has really helped me because every time I even think of my kids, my heart is warmed. Makes me happy to think of my kids, at least most of the time, except when they're bad. <clears throat> I would gladly lay down my life for either one of my kids, and I'm just a selfish mortal. God loves us so much more than that, so much more than that. You know, when we were at the beach on vacation, I was telling Jewel about how much I love her. We just... Our house that we were staying in was a short distance from the beach, not too far. Had to walk about 50 yards or so on a side street. And always make sure that when we're walking along the road, I'm holding her hand, and she's walking in the grass or on the edge of the road, and I'm on the outside. One afternoon, Jewel and I were walking back from the beach. Before I realized it, somehow she got on the other side. She's out in the road. And I'm walking on the edge. I'm like, whoa, no, come back over here. <laughs> She's like, why? And I told her that if a car was coming down the road and was going to hit one of us, I wanted it to be me and not her. She didn't say anything for a second. She thought about it. And she said, Daddy, if a car comes and hits one of us, I want it to be me. I said, wow. I said, that's incredible. But then she said, but if you did get hit by a car, I would call 911 for you. <laughs> I knew she was trying to tell me she loved me. <laughs> Thanks, I think. <laughs> but as I think about that conversation with Jewel, it makes me think of the cross. It makes me think of the cross. The Father, Son, and Spirit look down on you and me and said, if someone has to die because of sin, it's going to be one of us. It's not going to be you. It's going to be one of us. It's not going to be you or you or you or you or you. None of us. It's going to be one of us. Jesus is going to take the hit because he loves you that much. And because he's desperate to save you. Christ's death is an incredible demonstration. The eternal God who's always been an incredible demonstration of his love and care for each one of us. But you know he's proven his love in other exciting ways too. Very exciting ways. Going back to verse 6. It says that he has made us to be a kingdom of priests and kings priests and kings that is the status listen church 
That is the status of the redeemed. That's what they have in Christ because of their redemption from sin. Priests and kings. Christ has made his people to share his priestly office by identifying themselves with his death and resurrection. We can actually share in his glory by uniting our lives with his. We can be sure that we've been elevated to heavenly places with him as citizens of heaven. Citizens of heaven. Which means we need to live like citizens of heaven. Amen? John Pauline, he's a biblical professor and author, he nailed it. Here's what he said. The book of Revelation is not only a revelation of who Jesus Christ is, but a revelation of what we become when we unite our lives with him. The book of Revelation, above all, is a great appeal to God's people not to be constantly looking into the things of the world, not to be stuck in the sorrow and the troubles of this world, but to lift up our eyes to see Jesus in heavenly places. To see that we have been elevated in these heavenly places with him. When we see this fresh status that we have in Jesus, then we can really get excited about praising him and really get excited about serving him. Can somebody please say amen to that? No, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit want us to know that they will soon be on their way. We talk about Jesus coming, but the Father and the Spirit are going to be there too. You realize that, right? They're all coming. They're all coming to take us to a place where there's no more funeral homes. No more hospitals. Sorry, Dr. Pat. No more car wrecks. No more lawyers. Sorry, Mark. No more bankruptcy. No more arguments, murders, war, or politics. Thank you, Jesus. But instead, a bright and glorious eternal future. And all the while, we'll see Jesus and the Father face to face along with all the heavenly angels. What an incredible thought that is. To ensure us of the reality of the second coming... He tells us that every eye is going to see Jesus come. This is not some fairy tale. This is real. This is a real event that's going to happen, and it's fast approaching, and it's going to bring this world to end suddenly and unexpectedly. Some will be ready. Many will not. But please know that all of heaven wants you and wants me to be ready. This introductory section of the book of Revelation ends with God speaking directly, kind of putting his seal of approval on everything that's been said thus far, to let his people know that he really does care about them personally and individually. Again, which is why he gave the revelation to John in the first place. He says, I am the Alpha and the Omega The beginning and the end, says the Lord, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. What an awesome God we serve. I don't know what's going on in your life right now. I don't know what you're struggling with right now. But please understand, the events of your life are not happening by chance. The bad times and the good are either orchestrated or allowed by your Heavenly Father With one thought in mind, I've got to save my son. I've got to save my daughter. God is closer than you think right now. During the most difficult times of your life, that's when God's the closest. Even when you and I are rebellious, he continues to prepare our heavenly home for us. Because he believes in us. He knows what we can become through him. How's your faith this morning? How's your walk with Jesus this morning? Are you walking closely with Jesus? Are you keeping him at arm's length? Are you playing games with him? Answer that question to yourself. Hope you're beginning to realize how much the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit love you and are fighting for your salvation.
They've done so much already, and they continue to work to this day. And they'll be working tomorrow and the next day and the next day until we see Jesus in the clouds of glory. If you need more convincing still, come back next week. Because John has a revelation that's sure to get your attention. I'm going to be speaking on that next week. But please, before I shut this thing down, please don't let the devil distract you with the things of the world or the things in the world because the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are counting on you living with them throughout all eternity in heaven. Isaac Storm is a very interesting book about the hurricane that wiped out Galveston, Texas in the year 1900. One of the main plots of the book is about how everyone was convinced that a hurricane could never strike Galveston, Galveston, Texas. Even as this enormous hurricane approached, they said it's never going to happen. The author vividly describes how as the streets began to flood, people went about their business as if nothing was wrong. Children were playing in the water as it was puddling up on the streets. Men gathered for breakfast in the local diner as if it was just going to be another day. No one fled from the storm that was about to strike. Some didn't worry, at least in part, because of this gentleman, Isaac Klein, the National Weather Service officer in Galveston. He assured them that it wasn't going to be a severe storm. It's not going to be bad, he said. Others simply believed that Galveston was invincible. Still others thought that they had never seen a hurricane strike Galveston, so it's not going to happen. So for a number of reasons, people assured themselves that nothing bad was going to happen. And as a result, at least 8,000 people, some say it may have been as high as 12,000 people, died that day. To date, it was the deadliest hurricane in the history of the United States, all the way back in the year 1900. Listen to me, church. When we look around us in the world, we see storm clouds on the horizon. All the warning signs are telling us that time is short and Jesus is coming soon. There's moral and spiritual decline everywhere we look. The warning signs are there for us to see. The sirens are blasting right now. They tell us that Jesus is coming soon. They call us to return to the Lord if we wandered away, either publicly or maybe wandered away in our hearts and are just still going through the motions. I wonder this morning, when Jesus comes, Will your family and friends walk through the gates of pearl saying, I wish he would have responded and surrendered his life to Jesus. I wish she would have responded and surrendered her life to Jesus. They would be here with us right now. Or will you and I be some of the first ones through those gates of pearl? You see, your story hasn't ended. My story hasn't ended. It's still being written And the pen is in our hands. It's in our hands. What will your future destiny hold? What will it be? I want to challenge you about getting serious about your relationship with Christ. Putting him before everything else in your life. We say that all the time. You're not going to walk out of this church. There's no way you're going to leave this church and not hear that message. Over and over and over. Because that's what we need to hear. We're the people of the last days. We live in a world that's trying to pull us every direction but to Jesus. Like Isaac Klein, the world says, relax. Don't worry. Everything is going to go on just the same as it always has. Tomorrow will be just like today. And the next day and next week and next year. Nothing is changing, but God, God through the Apostle John says time is almost gone. No, there's not much time left now before Jesus returns. 
And some of us won't live that long. So today truly is the day of salvation. What's holding you back from making a full surrender of your life to Christ? What's holding you back? I want you to imagine with me for a moment how good it would feel to know that your salvation is secure, to not always be wondering, or having that nagging pain in your heart, something's not right, something's not right. Imagine how good it would feel to know your salvation is secure. I want you to imagine how good it would feel to turn your back on that sin that's held you for so long, that's kept you in bondage for so long. Imagine how good it would feel to be walking closely with your Savior. I want to challenge you in the coming week to take just one step. Do one thing in the coming week. Just one step in that direction. Just one thing. Let go of the sin that's changed you. Stop hanging out with that person that's pulling you back. Start spending time every day. Get up early if you have to. Half hour early, you normally do. Spend time with Jesus every day. It will be the best decision you could ever make because soon and very soon we are going to see the King. Amen. Soon and very soon, soon and very soon, we are going to see the King. Soon and very soon, we are going to see the King. Everybody sing soon. Soon and very soon, we are going to see the King. Hallelujah. 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 We're going to see the king. No more crying there. No more crying there. We are going to see the king. No more crying there. We are going to see the king. No more crying there. No more crying there. We are going to see the king. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah, we're going to see no more dying there, no more dying there, we are going to see the King, no more dying there, we are going to see the King, no more dying there. We are going to see the King. Hallelujah. 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 We're going to see everybody soon and very soon. Soon and very soon. We are going to see the King. Soon and very soon. We are going to see the King. Soon and very soon, we are going to see the King. Hallelujah, 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 we're going to see the King. Amen. Soon and very soon, do you believe it? Jesus will soon be on his way. I don't want you to get discouraged thinking that he doesn't care, thinking that he's not listening. He hears every prayer you whisper up. He's working. He's working out a plan in your life and mine. Keep trusting. Keep a positive attitude and keep your eyes heavenward because soon and very soon we're going to see the king. Let's pray. Father God, Thank you so much for the promise and for the giving this revelation to John.
to give to us. Lord, there's so much more in this book. There's so much more. But I know this is a special message to those of us living here at the end of time. You want to let us know that this world's about to wrap up. Now's the time. Not tomorrow, not next week, not next year. Even if our friends are not doing it, give us the courage to stand up for you. Even if the world is telling us sin is okay, and that's what's going to bring us happiness, it's a lie. Let us see that lie. Let us follow you. Thank you, Jesus. We know you're coming soon. Please seal us with your Holy Spirit till the day of redemption, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Soon and very soon We are going to see the King Soon and very soon We are going to see the King Soon and very soon We are going to see the King Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah we are going to see the King soon and very soon. Soon and very soon. We are going to see the King soon and very soon. Soon and very soon. We are going to see the King soon and very soon. We are going to see the King. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, we're going to see the King. Hallelujah, 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 we're going to see the King. One more time. Hallelujah, hallelujah, we're going to see the King.